we were able to get for this uh, NRP, the fifth one, a different approach here of a number of the big users, um, in fact, across the board users, to give you examples. Um, we had a number uh, uh, that we wanted to get that had uh, conflicts of trips and PhD exams and everything else, and we were going to substitute one more person for that. And uh, Frank asked if I would instead go through and summarize a number of the others, and these are going to be very brief summaries. And as I was doing that, I was thinking, well, you know, why don't I just show the whole community uh, of users of NRP and then dive in on that and explain also how we picked, you know, how the people you've seen um, sit across uh, that community. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, it's going to be, of course, very brief per investigator, uh, but I will show you um, a remarkable scale that the NRP user community has attained. So I'm Larry Smarr. Um, I'm a professor emeritus uh, at UC San Diego in computer science and engineering, founding director of Cal IT2 and the PI uh, of the Pacific Research Platform and a number of other grants that uh, led to Frank Wertheim now leading the National Research Platform. So where did all this AI and ML on the NRP come from? Uh, Tom Defani, uh, who was my co-PI on this NSF grant, was the, really the, the person who understood that this almost discontinuous change over the last few years was going to happen. And so five years ago, he uh, said, you know, what we really have to do is to get out to the computer science departments and get them using this infrastructure. That was a radical thought for those of you who are in computer science or know a computer scientist. Uh, the idea that they'd actually compute on infrastructure? Seven years ago. Seven years ago, he had the idea. Okay, good. So um, the, the uh, other issue was how could you get GPUs? Because we were told over and over again by these researchers that, um, you know, I got one under my desk, but that's kind of limiting my work. And so Tom had the brilliant idea of, of going out and getting the gaming, the 32-bit GPUs, uh, which, you know, NVIDIA at that time was shipping about 50 million a year. And so uh, he then went around and selected a whole set of these are the campuses uh, that were in that proposal, uh, interviewed a whole bunch of computer science faculty to come up with uh, the... Uh, uh, c cognitive hardware and software ecosystem, community infrastructure, Chase CI. And that was bolted onto the PRP, which itself was built out of the scenic regional optical networks. And we're going to hear more from Jen Leisure tomorrow about how uh, Quilt, uh, the uh, superset of the regional optical networks, has been so critical in uh, building out the uh, NRP. Uh, Ken Cristagato, uh, is, uh, who was a professor here at the time, now retired, uh, uh, is one of the most uh, deep and outstanding uh, experts in machine learning and AI and understands the history of it better than any human being I've ever talked to. He may be overtaken by a GPT soon. But... Until then, uh, and so he was a co-PI, and a lot of what I'm going to tell you in terms of the classification um, of um, machine learning and AI came uh, from Ken in that proposal. Now, last year, and it's hard to believe it's only a year ago, uh, at 4NRP, um, we showed the new, at that time, uh, video on the PRP. And I think many of you saw that then. It's still on the web, and I recommend it. it. It's held up very well. But we had three very large examples of the use uh, of the PRP. Uh, the neutrino detector, uh, the NSF South Pole neutrino detector ice cube, uh, hooking together a variety of virtual reality systems over uh, Scenic, and then, of course, the wildfire um, application with uh, Ilkay Altinas, who spoke 
uh, to us yesterday, uh, notice that there was no mention one year ago. I recorded this I, in, in maybe December of 22. No mention of AI or ML. Well, here's the last six months of users of the NRP on a log, log plot. I can only do that, I only know how to do that because I'm an astrophysicist. I don't understand anything if it's in a log, if it's not in a log plot. That's our community. Every one of those dots is a namespace, about uh, 250 of them. Uh, and uh, this is fresh data. Tom uh, provides me with the spreadsheets and, and then I um, do my astrophysical thing on them. Um, so the question is, how do we take 250 active things and boil it down to the few talks you've heard yesterday and today? Well, the first thing you'll notice is only three of those were large-scale, non-AIML community efforts. IceCube, which is using the GPUs for parallel computing of uh, photon tracks and the ice under the South Pole, um, the open uh, force field, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is a community effort to make better uh, quantum mechanical force fields for molecular dynamics, and the open science grid um, opportunistic, which has a variety of different physics uh, and astronomy projects that it supports. You see all those other blue dots? Almost all of those are using AL or MI uh, algorithms. It's pretty extraordinary. So how did we choose our speakers? Well, uh, yesterday you heard from Dinesh, and the little black star is on top of the blue dot that represents uh, that namespace. Uh, then you heard from Bing Bing. He had two, remember? Uh, then from Zeolong um, with the humanoid robots. Uh, ben Smar uh, from uh, talking about time series. Ravi with the fabulous uh, 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 visualizations and the nerfs that we heard. And then today you heard from Phil Harris uh, on um, LIGO, uh, Maya on, on SmokeyNet, Amon on the genomics. So that gives you an idea on a log log plot, which is 1 million by 10 million to one in terms of the usage of CPUs and GPUs. That's a start, <laughs> but as they used to say, there are, there are many stories hidden in the NRP uh, that, are, that we could reveal. So I, I think it's just extraordinary to see how this has developed in, in, in just seven years. Uh, uh, and going forward, of course, it'll just uh, probably exponentiate. Uh, so I'm going to tell you just a few more stories uh, of namespaces um, uh, from uh, uh, an example of using the open, uh, the open force field, uh, another AI robotics, and then two from physics. So how did this all happen? Well, if you go back to the Chase CI, one of the things that Ken uh, Crostogata helped us with is what we used to call the six-fold way. And he said, well, look, Larry, historically, these are the six, this is the way I kind of chunk out the different kinds of algorithms, uh, the deep, deep uh, neural nets and, and recurrent neural nets, of course, the CNNs, the GANs, uh, actually the transformer neural nets, which are the large language models. Uh, then there's reinforcement learning, which uh, Zilong was showing you. That's how they teach the robots to dance and walk and high five and all that. Um, then variational cores, uh, Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo, which uh, stochastic sampling, um, support vector machines. Uh, some of our big users using CPUs, a vast amount of CPUs use that. Sparse uh, signal processing, uh, latent variable. So, you know, the question is, does the NRP community use these? Well, how do you figure it out? I recommend you go what I did to learn all this. You go to that URL at the bottom, which has 
all thousand namespaces and it has a, de a description of what that namespace is doing and you search for GNN, you search for neural net and you will find uh, the uh, namespaces that are doing that. Now, why is that important to you? Because if you are thinking or your students are thinking about using one another of these AIML things, wouldn't you like to go and find a faculty and their students who are already doing it on the NRP? And then they would be collegial, tell you, you know, this is how we did it. Then you use Matrix, which has, I don't know, 800, 1,000 of the NRP community that says, hey, I'm having trouble with the GNN. Have you any of you tried that? That's how we bootstrap up this whole community. And that's why it's a community built, community run system by its architecture, because otherwise we'd never be able to get this thing. We couldn't move fast enough for the rate the field is going. And so you'll you'll notice that when I the way I I found this all out is I just literally spent hours searching through the namespaces and teaching myself what is this community doing, and and then wrote it up for Tom. Um, so anyway, there's there's what we find is that. Most of them are using neural nets or reinforcement learning, and that's why we had both examples in the speakers we had. Um, as far as the actual software, PyTorch is the most widely used, TensorFlow and then Keras are, are the next. Um, and then um, there are a bunch of different uh, neural nets, and particularly uh, deep neural nets that are, that are used. And I'm just, in fact, you heard yesterday a good example of long short-term memory, uh, LSTM, um, uh, uh, RNNs, um, and the, a lot of, um, you know, reinforcement learning as well. And of course, the transformer neural nets have become the big deal uh, these days with the large language models, but not just the large language models. BERT, you heard somebody talk about BERT yesterday, which is used in natural language processing. BIT is used a lot in the vision language models. Um, and so forth. So uh, the point is, and uh, by the way, all the slides of all the speakers and the videos of the talks are going to be available uh, on the, uh, this is for on a purpose so that you have them as a reference. Uh, so you don't have to just uh, figure it all right in real time. Now, as somebody who spends most of their time uh, on the NRP going through uh, vast spreadsheets and trying to understand what's going on in the user community, uh, to me, one of the biggest things that happened since we talked last is that IceCube, which was using essentially the, the, the uh, cycles, the GPUs that weren't being used by uh, the other namespaces, has been dethroned. And Open Force Field is, which is another giant community uh, project um, uh, that uh, David Mobley at uh, Irvine is the leader of. It's a big community project has taken over. And so you'll notice it's really quite amazing. They're both peaking at about 300 GPUs per day over the, this is, all these are six months. By the way, I, I actually spent many, many hours uh, creating all of these graphs you've been seeing. It's, it's what you do as a retired person. And, um, and so you go to Grafana and you, you, you know, you use your little cut and paste screen capture die. And then you go to the spreadsheet that Tom produces and, you know, it's, it's harmless fun. Uh, anyway, you'll notice it's, what's very cool is you learn a lot of stuff. Like they're both, both of these giant efforts, are, uh, community efforts, are using about the, peaking about the same. However, um, the open force feel, and I color code down at the bottom, uh, that's what's going on. Here, although normally I have GPUs and CPUs on uh, top and bottom, I'm now comparing directly the GPUs to the GPUs of these two different namespaces. And um, uh, Open Force Field is now over double what IceCube is in the last five years. Well, uh, remember what Open Force Field is. It's open because it's open software, open data, open science, um, and it used then the PRP to do quantum chemistry. So again, it's producing a vast number of data sets. You remember, yeah, okay. And uh, yesterday, events were talking about all these data sets that you can then use the you know GPTs on and so forth. Well, that's one of the main things they do. Uh, and then these are used uh, by a lot of people as a, as a you know public data set for drug discovery. Uh, and so 
what happens again? I'm not going to go through this all again, but but you know you you end up using the open force field um, toolkit to end up with this uh, uh, quantum um, database, a QC archive, and then the QC archive goes through a set of things to distributed computing, and that's where the PRP came in. And then this diagram showed you what happened when it began using Nautilus back in, in, in uh, 2019, and then as they learned how to, that what Nautilus did, they increased, the, they came up with a new rev of the software, and you can just see how much uh, the jobs completed took off. Um, so, um, you, like I say, I talked about this before, you've heard about this, so I'm not gonna go into more detail, but then I wanted to show you the newcomer, uh, who uh, John uh, uh, Kodera, who's, guess what, from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I mean, this is getting serious stuff. This is actually getting used, really. I mean, notice that this is six months, right? Now we're back to GPUs and CPUs. Um, and, and only really just uh, basically from New Year's uh, has he been really cranking. And what's he been cranking on? Well, turns out, that starting back with uh, a few years ago, um, NIH uh, realized where it was coming and they've funded a $68 million open science drug discovery effort uh, uh, called Natural Enough ASAP. Uh, but this is using AI and ML and computational chemistry to accelerate drug discovery. Uh, and here's just an example of what John has been able to do. And these are slides, each of these slides I'm showing you, the, you know, the, the PI has sent me the slides to use. Um, and so the red shows what happens in terms of the number of uh, these, uh, uh, these force fields that are able to be calculated. Uh, and the blue was what they were doing before NRP came along. The red is after they started really using NRP. So it's quite amazing. Uh, and this was used uh, to uh, rush through some of the COVID-19 um, drug, uh, sort through those, uh, but it's being used in a whole bunch of other fields now. Okay, well who, that was, as I said, you may remember uh, that the um, open force field, I didn't say that, was uh, essentially the number one GPU uh, user out of a thousand namespaces uh, uh, last uh, six months. And so who is number two? Well, number two turns out to be pure AI. It's Hao Su, who is uh, a faculty member in my department here in computer science at UCSD. And notice, not only did he um, use almost 200, almost a quarter of a million GPU hours, he used five million CPU hours in addition. And uh, this in six months, by the way. Uh, and so th the main thing he's doing is robot learning. If this is it's so weird, you know. I mean, we're we're just so transitioning into a new world um, that they build a digital twin in VR for object manipulation of robots. Then the specialist robots, uh, which are basically neural nets learn these specific skills by trial and error, and then these generalists come in and eat that and, and use it to distill knowledge and make um, uh, general rules. Well, the trouble is you have to train hundreds of specialists, and each specialist is trained in millions, millions of variants of their environment that they're working in, and this is like 10,000 uh, hours a run, <laughs> right? So, so this kind of learning is how you end up being the number one GPU user in the country out of a thousand namespaces. And I just think that shows the scale that we have yet to you know, get to. Well, let me switch to a couple of other examples which are now disciplinary um, uh, applications of AI and ML, which is what today was about. Um, and I'm coming back to Frank Bertheim and, and Javier Duarte uh, in the physics department and this is their CMS um, ML namespace. And um, this is their usage, um, uh, both in uh, GPUs and CPUs. Uh, and again, um, I'm not gonna go into any kind of detail, but essentially they're taking the CMS, this is the 
one of the two detectors on the Large Hadron Collider, uh, and then using machine learning on the data analysis. And there are people all over the world that are doing this sort of thing. But this is sort of a, a frontier uh, CMS, and they're looking at particularly for jets that come out in the, the when these things are collided uh, to use again uh, dimensional reduction based uh, machine learning. It's a clustering technique, which you see over on the right, uh, for unsupervised uh, anomaly detection. Uh, and again, they're using the public Large Hadron Collider CMS database. And this is, you know, this is a trend. You know, this is, we keep hearing over and over again, they're making all these databases available so that people can go in and do this kind of experimentation that hasn't been done before. I mean, it's been a zillion people. Harvey uh, is one of the great leaders of this community uh, that uh, is with us. And, and you know, there are people all over the world that are doing CMS and, and uh, 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 other, detector, other detectors analysis. But this idea of now bringing AI and ML techniques is what's new. Uh, and here again, you're doing particle flow reconstruction using scalable neural nets. Um, uh, then Rose Yu, who is uh, one of our assistant professors <coughs> here and, and also in the, the HDSI Data uh, Science Institute, she has a bunch of different uh, namespaces that are really doing wonderful I think just some of the most innovative work in bringing AI and ML into physics. Uh, and you can see here her usage um, uh, in both the GPUs and CPUs. Um, so what is she doing? Well, she's basically taking all these different fields. This is called physics-guided AI. So she's looking at things where you have spatio-temporal data. So things that are varying in space, things that are varying in, in time, and then these are all the different kinds of things she's applying it to, from public health to transportation, climate science, biomedical, et cetera. Uh, all of these things are spatio-temporal dynamics, and therefore she can use a sort of a common way of doing it. The other thing she's doing, and this is where I think, you know, we're going to get some really strange things happening, is she's taking the first principle sort of physics, differential equations, the sort of thing I grew up, you know, when a kid... Uh, learning, as my all my degrees are in physics, um, and then applying these new, you know, these parallel uh, learning techniques. Uh, new, there are several of these are 100, 200 years old, you know, these techniques. I, I always like to call them, uh, instead of just AI, it's statistical machine learning because it grew out of several hundred years of statistics. Um, and, and so neural nets and, and, and uh, the Bayes techniques and so forth. And then applying these to actually do um, discovery in physics. Uh, it's really, I wish she could be here. She is a, um, amazingly enough, uh, on top of doing all this, uh, has just become a, a new brother. And so she's on maternity leave and that's why she couldn't be here, but otherwise she would have been. Um, but anyway, she's, she's just amazing. Anyway, you encode all this um, uh, inductive bias, improve the generalization, uh, and the whole idea of this is to increase trust in AI, which from Katie's talk is one of the core features of NAIR. Okay, so this is, and you're hearing a lot just in the discussions and in, in the media about AI and so forth. So the fact is that we're seeing physicists, computer scientists, hybrids bringing techniques to end up with what's often called trustworthy AI um, and, and an understanding not only why you got the answer, but can you believe the answer and how did you get the answer? This is going to be at the heart of what the whole national program is about. Uh, and so that, again, is a, something that we're going to see a lot more come next year. You're going to see more and more of, of people that are bringing this sort of trustworthiness into the application space. Well, amazingly enough, for some reason, my name is associated with one of the namespaces, uh, which is Jupiter Lab. I actually don't know historically how that happened. You, you had to blame somebody, Tom says. Okay, good. Well, I 
I take it as a badge of, of uh, honor that my name is associated with this because frankly, I was stunned to hear Katie. I mean, remember, this is the head, this is the director of the Office of Advanced you know, Cyber Infrastructure at the NSF. She is running the whole damn program. And she said, you know, if it was me, I'd be using Jupiter. That's a deep statement. Because having helped launch the web with Mosaic back at NCSA, based on Tim Berners-Lee's HTML and HTTP protocols, what is Jupyter? It's essentially, after we've done um, cat videos and, and we've done, you know, words and books and everything else on the web, what about software? What about code, data, visualization? And effectively, that's what Jupyter does. It completed that process for those of us in data science and, and machine learning. Well, you see all of this. That wasn't me running on the NRP. That was 268 registered users who went through you know, this Jupyter Lab namespace as the way to get on the NRP. Now, it turns out that this is, I think, going to sweep the country, and we're fortunate that we have a big representation here from Cal State University San Bernardino, uh, because they, several years ago, started putting together what they called a high-performance computing program which is a very general program that includes not just NRP, but the supercomputer centers, the cloud, and so forth. But they have from faculty to Dungvu, where are you, and various others here. Everybody, who's from San Bernardino? Raise your hand. I mean, you, you know, there's a number of you here, right? okay? Um, and so what they did is by helping, by forming a group on the campus whose job it was not to use this stuff, but to help their faculty and students use it. Cal State San Bernardino burned more NRP, CPU, and GPU hours in the last year than eight of the 10 UC campuses. You know, take that. <laughs> and there's more coming right behind them. How did they do it? Well, it's called Jupiter. They use the, what Tom Defani has always taught me is, the easy button, okay? You basically, they put up a Jupiter, a Jupiter hub that links into Nautilus, there's a URL. They use the CI logon, which is their just authentication technique. The reason we use CI logon is because that's what so many of the campuses use for authentication. Uh, and guess what? 450 users on their campus, distinct people, okay? So this is the amplification that is possible uh, through, through Jupiter. And then they have, of course, a whole um, page on, on uh, one of the pages on how to, you know, access it. So this is, this is the front door. And it's, it's great that we have a lot of faculty and graduate PhD students and postdocs that are doing very detailed work on one little thing. This, once you get it working in Jupyter, you just give the URL to your friend. And now they're using it. They just push the easy button. This is gonna radically change things. Katie totally understands this. You know, I worked with her at NERSC. I was on the advisory board to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab director for years and years. And, and in fact, I led the review of their whole NERSC and, and ESNet system. She understands deeply how this stuff works. And now she's in charge of moving the whole country forward and of greatly increasing the workforce. So, what the next session is going to be is um, on how we can use this sort of thing and NRP-like capabilities to greatly increase through courses 
the output of our campuses in terms of trained AI ML people entering the workforce. The last time I lived through this was in 1985 when we had exactly the same concern, the Congress, you know, it's Japan and Germany are making supercomputers. I had to go to Germany, use a supercomputer. You know, it's a national emergency. We've got to get our people learning how to do supercomputing. And five years after the NSF set up the supercomputer program, we went from a, a one or 200 researchers in the US that had logged on to a supercomputer to 50,000 in five years that had logged on to one of the five supercomputers. I counted them personally. This is where we are again. And we have got, to, we, this is not business as usual. This is, it's war. We have got to get out and do what we, what our country can do better than any other country because we have the most elaborated higher education, multiple layer systems down to the community colleges of any country on earth. And so when we activate that, because there's some new thing that's come along like AI and ML, we can move out at a speed that nobody can match if we just do it. Now, I had one slide before we turn into that very important topic. I can't let everybody else have cool robot pictures and not me. <laughs> I was coming three weeks ago into the side door and I looked and I said, what is that? Fortunately, I am used to whipping my phone out and taking a video. I personally couldn't believe what I was seeing. But as we now know from yesterday, that was uh, Zeolong's group. And we now, I mean, that's normal from now on. We are entering, it's not Kansas anymore. It ain't, we ain't going back. We are going into an ambient embodied AI ML world that is radically different than humans have ever been in before. Frank, why don't you take over and introduce the panel on the talks on how we do that. Thank you.